When I went to see the exhibition of late work by Delacroix at the Philadelphia Art Museum, I was sorry to discover that the Louvre's famous self-portrait from 1837 that had prefaced the exhibition in Paris was not included. Instead, the teaser was a copy Delacroix had made of his early masterpiece, The Death of Sardinopoulos. Even this copy, donated to the Philadelphia Art Museum by the collector Henry McElhaney, <clears throat> is an extraordinary picture. But the self-portrait seemed to me much more appropriate as an introduction to the exhibition. Painted when Delacroix was nearing 40, the picture exudes an intense, challenging confidence seductively worldly, yet serious to the point of disdain. If it greets the visitor, it does so in a spirit that is as admonitory as it is welcoming. At first glance, it is possible, just, to see in this portrait the image of Delacroix, hero of Romanticism, an idol of Baudelaire, a nightmare for Nietzsche. <laughs> But there's obviously something else, something more going on as well. 100 odd pages into the development of modern art, the great German art critic Julius Meyergrafen observes that to write adequately about Delacroix would be to relate the whole history of modern art. The rest of that magisterial work from the turn of the century can be read as an effort to make good on that claim. The more one comes to know Delacroix, the more opposite Meyergrafe's observation seems, and the more exact. The Delacroix stands like a colossus at the outset of modern art, an ineluctable resource which Van Gogh and the Impressionists, Cezanne, Degas, and Matisse, suddenly, without whom, I'm sorry, without whom, uh, Van Gogh, the Impressionist, Cezanne, Degas, and Matisse suddenly become unimaginable. It is no accident, for example, that Degas owned more than 50 works by Delacroix, or that Cezanne could be easily goaded to violence by disparaging remarks made about the painter he considered one of his chief liberators. And yet Delacroix was far from regarding himself as a bold pioneer or liberator. All the great problems of art, he wrote when he was nearing 50, were solved in the 16th century about the passion for novelty, sometimes taken to be the very essence of modern art, he could be particularly stating. The new, he insisted, is very ancient. One may even say that it is always the most ancient thing there is. In fact, Eugène Delacroix is the despair of neat aesthetic categories. Textbooks tell us that he was romanticism incarnate the foremost neo-baroque romantic painter in the words of one. And they have plenty of evidence on their side. Who but a romantic could have painted the death of Sardinopoulos, for example? Painted in 1827 and now in the Louvre. That ironic homage to decadent Orientalism. The manner, Rubens with a high fever, is as startling as the matter. A doomed sybaritic king cruelly savoring from his couch of luxury the hasty destruction of all that he possesses. And who but a romantic could have painted liberty leading the people? That vote <clears throat> of solidarity with the principles of the July Revolution and by implication the Revolution of 1789. This was a Delacroix, or one of them anyway, who bewitched Baudelaire and unsettled Nietzsche. And beyond the good and evil, Nietzsche compared Delacroix to his idol turned nemesis, Richard Wagner. Both, Nietzsche wrote, were great discoverers in the realm of the sublime, also of the ugly and gruesome, and still greater discoverers concerning effects, virtuosos through and through, with uncanny access to everything that seduces, allures, compels, overthrows, born enemies of logic and straight lines, lusting after the foreign, the exotic, the tremendous, the crooked, the self-contradictory. Well, Nietzsche spoke as one who knew the seduction, the allurement, the compulsion firsthand. His language is the language of a love affair in which respect has vanished, but attraction continues to pulse. His disapproval was an acknowledgment of potency, 
as well as a warning label. The precincts of extremity that he sent bulletins about were dangerous, but they continued to beckon, were dangerous because they continued to beckon. Writing in the late 1950s, the German art historian Hans Zettelmeyer followed Nietzsche's cue and compared Delacroix to Wagner and to the architect Gottfried Zemper. In Delacroix, Zettelmeyer wrote, we can already see that curious affection for the Oriental, which is a mark of that epoch. It is not the Orient as we think of it today. There was for Delacroix and his contemporaries nothing passive, passive or lethargic about it. The Orient to painters of the 40s was luxuriant, sensual, and voluptuous, a place of lowering passion and heat. Delacroix would have been surprised, to say the least, by all this. The accusations of vertiginous self-contradiction no less than the evocations of lowering passion and heat. The so-called geniuses that we see today, he wrote in 1855, full of ridiculous affection and marked by bad taste as much as by pretension, are beclouded in whatever ideas they possess. Even in their personal conduct, they continue the bizarre manner, which they look on as a sign of talent. The great genius is simply a being of more highly reasonable order. The comparison with Wagner would have struck Delacroix as particularly odd. He stressed over and over again that, quote, real superiority admits no eccentricity. Wagner seemed to him, as to many others, to represent the apotheosis of eccentricity. His own first impressions of the composer, recorded in his journal, which is perhaps the greatest literary testament any painter has left us, begin to suggest how extravagant is what we might call the Orientalist, Wagnerian view of Delacroix. This Wagner wants to be an innovator. He thinks that he has reached the truth. He suppresses a great many of the conventions of music, believing that conventions are not founded on necessary laws. He's a democrat. He also writes books about the happiness of humanity, books that are absurd. Delacroix wants to find the classical as that which is suited to serve as a model. In this sense, the classical was what he aspired to emulate and what he thought all artists should aspire to emulate. As for the opposition between classical and romantic approaches to art, Delacroix observed that a good many artists imagine they are classical because they are cold. Similarly, there are some who believe they have warmth because they are called romantic. The true warmth is that which consists in moving the onlooker. When an admirer once approached Delacroix with the intended compliment, you are the Victor Hugo of painting, Delacroix responded coolly, no, you are wrong, monsieur, I'm a pure classicist. And yet one suspects that being identified as romantic was less irritating to Delacroix than discovering that the commandment the commendation of classical was bestowed upon his great artistic antipode, on And did his best to avoid mentioning Delacroix's name in public. In his writings, he tended to refer to his younger Bible as, quote, the apostle of ugliness. For his part, Delacroix dismissed Pang's pretentiousness, pretensions to classical perfection as fake. I prefer, he wrote, David to this mixture of antiquity with a bast bastard Raphaelism. It is a pity that Baudelaire, who died insane of syphilis in 1867, did not have the opportunity to read Delacroix's journal. The poet was one of Delacroix's earliest, most articulate, and most steadfast enthusiasts. And although he recognized the complex nature of Delacroix's art, he once described him as passionately in love with passion and coldly determined to seek the means to express passion in the manner most visible. Baudelaire probably did more than anyone to solidify the, the image of Delacroix as a kind of romantic icon. He wrote about the painter's work numerous times, beginning with the notice of the Salon in 1845 and ending in 1864, the year after Delacroix's death, with a long and appreciative obituary. Baudelaire did not go in for understatement. 
Already in 1845, he had concluded that Delacroix was, quote, decidedly the most original painter of ancient or modern times. Delacroix's audacious painterly technique, his startling, startling color, the way he, like Rubens and Jericho, exaggerated certain proportions for effect, was part of what attracted Baudelaire. But what really captivated the poet was Delacroix's conjugation of exotic, hitherto incommunicable emotional tones, a divine opium for mortal hearts, he called it. Never mind that from the very beginning, Delacroix's oeuvre had included works of chaste and brooding seriousness. At the 1820 Salon, for example, one could see a somber agony in the garden, as well as Sardinalis, a very different sort of work. For Baudelaire, Delacroix was primarily a fleur de mal, a daring spiritual beacon, unencumbered by shop-worn moral or artistic conventions. Thus he occupies, alongside Rubens, Da Vinci, Rembrandt, Goya, and a somewhat startling addition, Watteau, an honored place in his poem, The Beacons, Les Fog, Baudelaire's poetic catalog of artistic heroes. The relevant verses will give you a sense of the wattage of Baudelaire's feelings. Delacroix, lake of blood haunted by evil angels, shaded by a wood of firs always green, or under a chagrined sky, strange fanfares pass like a stifled sigh of vapor. These maledictions, these blasphemies, these complaints, these ecstasies, these cries, these tears, these te deums, are an echo repeated by a thousand labyrinths it is, for mortal hearts, a divine opening. Yes, well, maybe. Delacroix must surely have been grateful for Baudelaire's constant attentions. And he did a lot to put Baudelaire on the map. And even today, Baudelaire's imprimatur is worth a great deal. Nevertheless, the painter maintained a certain reserve when it came to the poet and his enthusiasms. Baudelaire is mentioned only a few times, and then only in passing in Delacroix's journal. Indeed, the journal reveals a sensibility far more steady and far more sober than Baudelaire's evil angels, strange fanfares, and assorted tears, sighs, blasphemies, ecstasies, and te deums accommodate. Perhaps the chief merit of the exhibition of Delacroix's late work that started at the Grand Palais, which is now at the Philadelphia Museum, is that it helps complicate the received view of the artist as a romantic archetype. The curators of the exhibition, which was organized to coincide with the bicentennial of Delacroix's birth, are no doubt correct when they write that passion will ever be at the heart of any discussion of Delacroix. But of course, the relation between passion and art, between passion and successful art anyway, is famously complicated. T.S. Eliot was on to something important when he observed in his famous essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent. <laughs> Poetry is not a turning loose of emotion, but an escape of emotion, escape from emotion. It is not the expression of personality, but an escape from personality. But of course, Elliot adds, only those who have personality and emotions know what it means to want to escape from such things. Something analogous, I think, can be said about the place of emotion, of passion, in all the arts. Now, there's plenty to quibble with in this exhibition, especially in its Philadelphia incarnation. But by focusing on the last 13 years, from 1850 to 1863, of Delacroix's immensely prolific career, which all told yielded 1,000 oil paintings, 2,000 watercolors, and nearly 1,000 drawings, this exhibition does invite us to rethink the nature of Delacroix's achievement. Above all, it has the effect of reasserting the place of deliberation, conscience, and aesthetic delicacy, the elements of mind and culture, you might say, in the appreciation of his art. Another way of putting this is to say that if Delacroix was a romantic, he was a romantic in flight from the excesses of romanticism, a distinctively modern type of the species. There was much about Delacroix's family situation to encourage this amalgam of passion and reticence, exuberance and unfathomable reserve. Delacroix was born in a small town near Paris on April 1798, 
year six, according to the revolutionary calendar, which was then still in force. He was, by 14 years, the youngest of four children. The official entry at the Mairie duly lists Charles Delacroix and Victoire Aubin, who was 17 years younger than her husband, as the parents. There have, however, always been doubts about Delacroix's paternity. Charles, an ardent Republican who had been a regicide member of the convention, enjoyed a distinguished political career, but his health, at least in the later years, was poor. By August 1797, when he was posted to the Netherlands as ambassador, he'd been suffering for some, from some time, for some time from a debilitating tumor, which was successfully operated on later in the fall. His successor as Minister of Foreign Relations was Talleyrand, who took up his quarters at the Hotel de Galfe, while the rest of the Delacroix family was still living there. Eugène never indicated that he was aware of the rumors, but it was widely rooted that Talleyrand was his real father. As Duff Cooper observed in his biography of the statesman, Delacroix's paternity was, quote, generally ascribed to Talleyrand, and the theory was supported by strong facial resemblance and by the fact that in the early days of his career, the young artist was always in receipt of very valuable patronage and support from some mysterious and powerful source. Although Delacroix early on displayed an interest in painting, his artistic vocation did not really coalesce until his late teens, after the death of his mother in 1814. His father had died nearly a decade before, in 1805. In later life, Delacroix referred to painting as an exigent mistress, to whom everything else, even the steady stream of amour he had entertained in his youth, must be sacrificed. But in fact, Delacroix's commitment to art began, and in the deepest sense, I think, remained, firmly tied to a broader commitment to the world of high culture. I have told myself a hundred times, he wrote in 1850, that painting, that is to say, the material thing called painting, was no more than the pretext, than the bridge between the mind of the painter and that of the spectator. Meyer Grafford summed it up neatly when he observed that Delacroix was the last great painter who was also a man of profound culture. Delacroix grew up in a cultivated, though financially pressed, household, and early on developed a passion for reading that never left him. His journals, no less than his many paintings of subjects from literature, make it clear that Delacroix immersed himself in painting, in reading, I'm sorry, as in a rapt conversation among intimates. Here, for example, is the death of Lara, inspired by a tale of violence. One could uh, go through dozens and dozens of uh, of slides of, of his paintings from uh, literary subjects. One of the best, I think, in Philadelphia is uh, the marvelous, uh, marvelous picture of Lady Macbeth, a very small picture, but uh, really quite, quite marvelous. Books are one of Delacroix's chief lifelines to human reality. Cornet, Moliere, Racine, Shakespeare, Byron, Walter Scott, Homer, Virgil, Dante, Goethe, <coughs> La Rochefoucauld, Casanova's memoir, Plato, Tacitus, Plutarch, Rousseau, Kant, Voltaire, Diderot. Lillacroix's reading was as deep as it was wide. He read, criticized, and selectively admired the work of his friends Georges Sand and Balzac, Alexandre Dumas, and Stendhal. Music was also important to Lillacroix. He was a passionate devotee of Mozart and Rossini, delighted in Chopin, another close friend and the subject of a penetrating portrait that I could not get a slide of tonight, and distrusted Beethoven. Genius of Delacroix possessed in abundance, obviously, but his artistic career was a never-ending struggle to subordinate genius to taste. His lifelong endeavor, Meyer Graffa wrote, was to find a conventional language capable of fettering his strong expression. Thus Delacroix's intractable duality. In his facility of dramatic utterance, Meyer Graf continued, he was a romantic. But when his mighty mind had taken its rapid flight through space, the faithful workman followed after, smoothing with almost bourgeois exactitude the road which his lightning invention had struck out in the new domain. 
Delacroix left the Lycée in 1815 when he was 17 and entered the studio of Pierre Guerin, a protege of David. Delacroix stayed with Guerin less than a year. He entered the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in 1816, but he owed a great deal to the neoclassical painter. Among other things, it was in Guerin's studio that Delacroix first met the ill-fated Theodore of Jericho, whose dramatic subject matter and correspondingly dramatic sense of composition were a revelation. Jericho, alas, died in a riding accident in London in 1824 when he was 33, just when Delacroix's career was beginning to take off. In or about 1818, Jericho painted a haunting portrait, now in Guerin, of his young friend, a remarkable picture which is not in the show, uh, in which Delacroix's face hangs like a, an illuminated mask in a pool of darkness. A year later, Delacroix also posed for Jericho's most famous painting, The Raft of Medusa. He is a central figure, doubled, doubled over right in the, the, the corner of the, of the raft there, bending over toward the, toward the viewer with his head bowed and his left arm extended forward. Myrograph would call the raft the cradle of Delacroix's art. Delacroix would probably have agreed. He recalled when he saw the, the finished painting that the impression it made on me was so vivid that when I left, I ran home like a madman all the way to the Rue de la Planche, where I was then living. Jericho was one important influence on the young Delacroix. The Louvre in, in provided others, above all Rubens, Veronese, and Michelangelo whose work Delacroix diligently copied, and whose expressive rhetoric he absorbed. From the start, Delacroix's painting displayed considerable technical agility. He turned up political caricatures in the style of Rawlinson, religious pictures reminiscent of Raphael. But he did not become the artist we think of and recognize as Delacroix until he painted the remarkable picture of the Bark of Dante for the 1822 Salon. Alas, I, I could not get a slide of that either, but I'm sure. Uh, uh, most of you are familiar with that. Executed largely while a friend read aloud to him from the Divine Comedy, a book that Delacroix often returned to and often illuminated, illustrated. It portrays Dante and Virgil being driven across a Stygian lake in a, a boat, a spark, a small boat, beset by the clamoring damned, some of whom Dante recognizes as former Florentines. Although clearly indebted to the Raft of Medusa, the bark of Dante speaks in a register with a pathos all its own. Public and critical reaction to this early painting can be described as mixed at best. The French government nevertheless bought the painting for a respectable sum, one token perhaps of that valuable patronage and support from some mysterious and powerful source that Duff Cooper alluded to. There were other such tokens. An enthusiastic article about de Lacroix by the lawyer and diplomat Adolphe Thiers, for example, who was an ambitious political insider known not for his art criticism, but for his attachment to, to a close friend of Talleyrand. In the 1824 Salon, de Lacroix exhibited another early masterpiece, the Massacre at Chios. This large canvas portrayed a devastating scene from the Greek rebellion against the Turks, a conflict that had captured the imagination of all Europe. Byron, in fact, perished at Mizolonghi that same year uh, in his efforts to help the cause. Again, critical reaction was decidedly mixed. One critic called Delacroix's offering <coughs> the massacre of painting. And again, the French government purchased the work. 1824 was something of a turning point for Delacroix. He was lucky to have excited just the right amount of critical consternation. Together with the patronage he received, it assured his emergence as a figure of controversy, then, as now, a reliable prelude to success. It was after the massacre, Delacroix explained in a touching recollection, that I became the object of antipathy and a sort of bugbear. Most of those who took my side were really only defending theirs. They enrolled me willy-nilly in a romantic coterie, so making me responsible for their folly. I got out, of, got out of it by dint of not asking for too much, and thanks to an extreme self-confidence. That confidence, which is the talisman of youth. By this confidence, I don't mean a blind presumptuousness. I've never had an exaggeration, exaggerated esteem for what I've done. Nor, in fact, did most of the French cultural establishment. For example, it took multiple attempts over the course of 20 years, from 1837 to 1857, 
for de la Croix to win election to the Institut de France, an honor for which he seemed particularly eager. For de la Croix, the important discovery of the 1824 Salon was the work of John Constable, whose painting The Hayway was also exhibited there and made a great impression. In fact, his experience of Constable's work inspired him to repaint portions of the sky in the massacre at Chios at the last moment, just before it went into the, just before it went into the uh, cellar. It doubt, doubtless also helped stiffen his resolve to visit London. Like many French writers and intellectuals at the time, Delacroix was already what one critic called an Anglophile on principle. England seemed like the home of liberty uh, to Frenchmen at that time. The 6,000 francs he received from the French government for the massacre at Kiosk made it possible for him to travel to London in the summer of 1825. He met and became fast friends with the painter Richard Parks Bonington, whose watercolors he greatly admired. Like Jericho, Bonington died young. He fell victim to consumption only a few years later when he was 26. <coughs> Delacroix also learned to ride while he was in England, an experience that prompted some of his first animal studies. He became an avid devotee of the London stage, especially of Edmund Keane, the great, the great actor, and Shakespeare, another writer, by the way, to whom Delacroix often returned and whose work he would often illustrate. It is easy to imagine Delacroix as an ardent traveler. In fact, he traveled remarkably little outside France. Given the large place that Oriental themes have in his earth, it is significant that he went to Africa only once in 1832, when he accompanied a French commissioner on a five-month-long diplomatic mission and visited Morocco, Tangiers, <coughs> and Algiers, and a few other spots. During this trip, he traveled briefly to Spain. He went occasionally to stay with relatives in Strasbourg. In 1839, he traveled to Belgium and Holland. For the most part, however, the Lacroix shuttled between various addresses in Paris and a small house in champs rosé near Fontainebleau. He never went to Italy at all. Like many great artists, Delacroix was ruthless about his impressions. He exploited them shamelessly. He understood something that modern artists often forget, that what matters is not the number or the extent of impressions, but their depth. Arlette Serralaz, writing in the catalog for this exhibition, is no doubt correct that Delacroix was the first painter to penetrate the heart of Moroccan culture. But that penetration became evident only in the transforming crucible of recollection. Looking back on his trip to Africa some 20 years later, Delacroix noted that, I began to make something tolerable of my African journey only when I had forgotten the trivial details and remembered nothing but the striking and poetic side of the subject. Up to that time, I had been haunted by this passion for accuracy that most people mistake for truth. Not mistaking mere accuracy for artistic truth is one of the polemical anti angle lessons of Delacroix's art. But it is not the only lesson. Nor can it be understood apart from a larger context in which artistic truth turns out to depend, after all, on a kind of accuracy. Not the tab tabulated ac accuracy of optical or verisimilitude, perhaps, but that much more rigorous accuracy that consists in strict fidelity to the experience of the object. It was because he believed Angre failed to achieve, or even aim at, this larger accuracy that Delacroix so deprecated his rival's art. And it is because the counterfeit of such higher accuracy that Delacroix himself aimed at, it's because this counterfeit is such a staple of much romantic and post-romantic art, down indeed to our own time, that critics like Nietzsche and Zettelmeyer Meyer, have been suspicious of Delacroix. This exhibition of Delacroix's later work should allay such suspicions. It reveals not only the intensity, but also the extraordinary variety of Delacroix's achievement. Despite increasingly long and severe bouts of illness, <coughs> especially the recurrent tubercular laryngitis that he first contracted in the early 1830s and that would eventually kill him, Delacroix was as breathtakingly productive in his later years as he was early on. Indeed, in the last decade and a half of his life, 
he painted a host of exceptional pictures, including what many consider his greatest masterpieces, <laughs> the public decorations he carried out for the Galerie de Hollande in the Louvre, the Salon de Pay, the Hotel de Ville, destroyed by fire in 1871, alas, and his ultimate masterpiece, the sequence of murals he painted for the Chapelle uh, de Saint-Ange at Saint-Sulpice in Paris. These works, of course, are absent from the exhibition. It is a pity, though, that two preparatory studies uh, for some of these works, uh, work, works in the Gallery d'Apollon and the Salon de Pay, that were scheduled to be in the exhibition and that were in Paris, turned out to be too fragile to be included in Philadelphia. Likewise, it is a pity that several of Delacroix's larger works that were on view in Paris were not to be seen in Philadelphia. Truth in advertising should have required that the curators called the exhibition, at least in Philadelphia, Delacroix smaller lake works, excluding his greatest, greatest masterpieces. <laughs> Though I doubt that it would have made it by the public relations office. Still, many aspects of Delacroix's later work are re well represented here. The exhibition is divided into seven sections, animal and hunting pictures, like this, landscapes and still lifes, classical allegories, illustrations of literary works, works inspired by his trip to Africa, religious pictures, and last works, in which Delacroix returned to a number of themes he had painted in earlier years. The religious pictures are perhaps the greatest revelation. Delacroix was brought up in the secular traditions of the Enlightenment and Voltairean rationalism. Deism was one word for this position, but there are those who contend that deism is French for atheism. In this context, it is worth noting the remarkable conviction that some of Delacroix's late paintings of religious subjects exhibit. Especially memorable are the series of small oils depicting Christ in the Sea of Galilee, and there are five or six or seven in the exhibition at uh, Philadelphia. The stormy sky seems to reenact the stormy drama of the disciples' faith. And two large pictures of Christ on the cross, here's one of those, from 1846 and 1853, respectively. Um, as the catalog notes, such pictures suggest that the agnosticism <coughs> of Delacroix's youth was supplanted not by faith exactly, but by a genuine metaphysical anguish. Henry James made a similar observation in his review of Delacroix's letters in 1880. Writing about an 1848 depiction of the entombment of Christ, James said that it was, quote, the only modern religious picture I have seen that seemed to be painted in good faith. Of course, in good faith is not the same thing as from faith. Baudelaire probably got it right when he observed in 1846 that Delacroix perhaps alone in this century of non-believers, has created religious paintings that were neither empty nor cold, like some works created for competitions, nor pedantic, nor mystical, nor neo-Christian. Voltaire cited the genuine sadness such pictures communicate as one source of their power. But it is not, I think, simply a matter of sadness or recognition of loss. In that same review of Delacroix's letters, James noted that the, quote, the artist we value most is the artist who tells us most about human life. Delacroix's embrace of humanity did not omit the religious dimension of experience, a vestigial feature in the lives of many today, I realize, but central to the lives of most of humanity throughout history. Thus it is that he quotes with approval a book on aesthetics contending that, quote, Indifference to matters of religion must necessarily bring with it indifference to matters of art. Delacroix's own thoughts on the subject remain tentative and non-doctrinal. God, he wrote in a famous journal entry from 1862 at the very end of his life, is within us. He is the inner presence that causes us to admire the beautiful, that makes us glad when we do right, and consoles us for having no share in the happiness of the wicked. It is he, no doubt, who breathes inspiration into men of genius and warms their hearts at the sight of their own production. In some ways, Delacroix's achievement is bracketed by the furious energy of his animal paintings on one side and the meditative calm of certain of his literary and historical allegories on the other. Delacroix was, without doubt, one of the greatest painters of animals, especially of large cats and horses, whoever put brush to canvas. Not only did he manage prodigies of anatomical suggestiveness, 
His many trips to the zoo at the Jardin de Plantes gave him plenty of opportunity for observation. But also, even his qu quickest sketches communicate a sly, tightly coiled animal passion. One of the highlights of this exhibition is the lion hunt. Actually, there are several versions of it, which was commissioned by the French government for, 18, for the 1855 Exposition Universal. Upon leaving the salon, the painting was sent to the Musée de Beaux-Arts in Bordeaux, where it was damaged in a fire in 1870. You can see the top there is kind of missing. Um, even in its fragmentary state, however, it was a marvel of painterly energy. Never, Baudelaire wrote in his review, have more beautiful or more intense colors penetrated to the soul through the channel of the eye. It is, it is as if this painting, like the practitioners of magic or hypnotism, projects its thought from a distance. This remarkable phenomenon is owing to the power of the colorist, the perfect concurrence of tones and the harmony between the color and the subject. As this passage suggests, it was as a colorist that Delacroix tended to impress his contemporaries and artistic heirs most dramatically, though again, not always favorably. About the lion hunt, the French critic Maxime Ducamp wrote that, quote, color here is at its most extravagant and verges on raging madness. And there is a complete disregard for harmony since all of the tonal values are about equal. Monsieur de Lacroix will endure neither as a history painter nor as a painter of genre scenes. As a classical writer once put it, Monsieur de Lacroix is a leader not of a school but of a riot. This lion hunt is the height of eccentricity and does its utmost to rival the grotesque. Ducamp was not alone in his condemnation, but history has confined his opinion of the Lacroix's color to the minority, to perhaps even the crankish. Far more typical was Cezanne's comment about the women of Algiers. The color of the red slipper, he said, goes into one's eye like a glass of wine down one's throat. The Lacroix's technique involved a kind of proto-pointless maze of tiny brush strokes in which a rainbow of hues built up a vibrating skin of color. I mean, Ducamp is quite right that the, the tonal values are often very close to one another, but it's the, the overall effect of them that, that, that matters. The Lacroix's friend, Théophile Silvestre, the art critic, recalled that instead of simplifying the local colors by generalizing, the Lacroix multiplied the tones <coughs> on the item and opposed them to one another in order to give each a double in intensity. His color sparkles like a stream spattered by a shower. Unfortunately, I think that this is one aspect of the Lacroix's art that generally seems to have reached us in a diminished state. The Lacroix often complained about the quality of the pigments he used. We know that he tended to use rather cheap colors, and comparing his canvases with descriptions up to the early decades of the century, it is difficult not to conclude that his pictures have suffered considerable darkening. In pictures like The Lion Hunt, the fury remains, but not, I suspect, quite all of the brilliancy. Delacroix's animal pictures tend to exist at the romantic end of his emotional palette. At the other end are many of his allegorical scenes. One of the most arresting was Ovid Among the Scythians from the National Gallery in London. It portrays the moment when Ovid, the very embodiment of cosmopolitan sophistication, arrived at his place of exile at the bleak fringes of the Roman Empire in what is now Romania. He had offended us, as some of you remember, the Emperor Augustus and was banished forever from Rome. For us, you know that Ovid's exile was destined to be a life sentence. It was a portrait of quiet but intense melancholy. The Lacroix's muted tones and the depiction of vast, mountainous perspectives inspired to reinforce a sense of desolation that civilization feels when confronted with irremediable barbarism. This was not the first time that Delacroix portrayed this unhappy scene from Ovid's life, and the delicacy with which he treated the subject, to get together with the philistinism that Delacroix often felt surrounding him, <laughs> tempts one to regard it as something of a spiritual self-portrait or confession. Its pertinence in the cultural situation today makes it even more poignant. Thinking back to that self-portrait from 1837, I cannot help thinking here it is again. That it is not a portrait of a romantic, but of one who has triumphed over romanticism. 
one whose vocation is not, in Eliot's phrase, the turning loose of emotion, but its purgation and redemption through art. Thank you very much.